I should warn you that this takes um, this this unfolds in two parts with two interludes, and that'll give you some sense of, of where we are. Uh, and, and I suppose maybe a, a preface. Taking leave. I must begin with a confession. I am no philosopher. I can at best claim to have begun a rigorous but fragmentary study of certain philosophers when the questions that repeatedly arose in the course of my readings in poetry pointed me toward the regions, realms generally thought to be their domain. What draws me to these works is their relation to language, which to me, even in translation, makes a kind of poetry. I read philosophy, moreover, the way Dickinson speaks of reading verse, from the back to the front, by means of an overturning. The beauty of the works, the beauty of the works leads me back towards the rigor of their thought. The disadvantages of such a reading practice are certainly legion. I dare not list them in this company. The advantage of this kind of reading, if there is one, is the sudden discovery of unforeseen connections. The subject matter of this meditation late work is a long-standing interest of mine. My very first forays in Dickinson's archives were directed towards her late writings, and I have returned to these writings time and again over the last 30 years. But my approach to late work, not only in Dickinson, but as a phenomenon in and of itself, altered after the death of my father, the first person to ever read me Dickinson's poems in 2008, and again with the lightning and passing of my mother, a theorist of music who at last turned into a bird in 2016. Perhaps it is possible to pursue lines of inquiry in so pure a spirit that the personal never touches them. I imagine it is. I do not know this kind of inquiry. It seems that everything I have written in the name of scholarship has been in pursuit of a question, contradiction, delight or suffering that has followed me. The result is a project or a form of thinking that is radically vulnerable and perhaps too private. Still, I hope that these trials, for that is what these notes toward a talk amount to, will try our thinking together about lateness. And I apologize to the thinkers themselves for straying over the boundary separating thought and feeling. Part one, taking leave, late style. The condition of living in a completed world. In such a condition, we might find a knowledge of the nature of things, an acceptance from a human perspective of nature's inescapable processes, of time's passage, of the mutability of all things. Inhabiting such a condition might involve a new kind of seeing, not through a veil, but through the pellucid dark which light presupposes. Or perhaps a certain kind of hearing would be the gift bestowed, a hearing wherein the conduction of sound through the outer ear canal and into the tiny bones of the middle ear is not reduced but accentuated, so even the faintest sounds would be detected. There might come to at this apocalypse a spacious stillness, and perhaps in this moment the prominence of the human world would give way to a vision of the varied and abounding Umwelten adjacent to our own. Memory might not belong to us alone or exist at all, and in its place there might be only a blue hour, the present moment set alight by new stars. Under such conditions, we might propose that late work concerns the difference between disappearance and withdrawal. But is late work the work that anticipates its own disappearing, its departure without a trace? Or is late work the very work of withdrawal, the work that, as Heidegger puts it, draws us along in its withdrawing? And is this drawing along in withdrawing late style? I wish to begin by very briefly seeking out some of the meanings of these terms, late work, late style, in one key text by Adorno and another by Said, then testing these definitions in a few fragmentary verses by Emily Dickinson. 
Adorno's most compelling definition of late work appears in his 1937 essay, Late Style in Beethoven, a singularly spare essay that remains radically resistant to paraphrase. Most immediately, Adorno defines late style as bound up with difficulty in transigence. It is thought driven through the poles, escaping every category, a refugee from every attempt at analysis. Unlike the dialectical mode oriented towards synthesis, a mode embodied by the works of Beethoven's middle period and by the classical sonata, late work channels the negative dialectic involving by contrast, the suspension of synthesis. Thus, as Michael Spitzer remarks of Beethoven's late quartets, there is the withdrawal of the middle such that the material is polarized into categorical extremes which interact without closure. Marooned outside the dialectic and the forces of history, and recording an identity destabilized by its encounter with finitude, the late work as Adorno understands it, does not tranquilly resolve, but enters into the contingencies of nature in the terrain of the inorganic. The formal but also effective experience of lateness as a dissonance between late works and earlier works necessarily sunders the very idea of the totality of the oeuvre. The key, writes Adorno, to the very late Beethoven probably lies in the fact that this music, that in this music, the idea of totality as something already achieved had become unbearable to his critical genius. Under these new conditions, music proceeds via breakthrough, stylistic rupture, fractured lyricism, sejura. No longer seeking harmony and ripeness, refusing, in Adorno's words, to surrender themselves to mere delectation, late works require us to receive them as they are, devoid of sweetness. Bitter and spiny. The maturity of the late works of significant artists does not resemble the kind one finds in fruit. They are for the most part not round but furrowed, even ravaged. They lack all the harmony that the classicist aesthetic is in the habit of demanding from works of art, and they show more traces of history than of growth. The usual view of the late work explains this with the argument that they are products of an uninhibited subjectivity. The usual view, but not Adorno's. For insistently and enigmatically, Adorno holds that the late works are not reducible to psychological origins. On the contrary, in late works, Adorno imagines, a psychological origin is impossible because the artist has, as it were, eliminated himself. Beethoven's Missa Solemnis, the subject object of Adorno's most startling reading, is thus illuminated as a work of exclusion, of permanent renunciation, a work that lacks all unmistakably Beethovenian characteristics. The unearthly quality of late works, their shimmer, or in Adorno's German, their scheinen, comes from the artist's withdrawal from, or perhaps into, to the work so completely that all we see is the flicker of all aesthetic oppositions, the interplay of all categories. As such, the late works appear as witnesses to subjectivity at its outermost limit, and indeed as the limit. The power of subjectivity in the late works of art is the irascible gesture with which it takes leave of the works themselves. It breaks their bonds, not in order to express itself, but in order expressionless, to cast off the appearance of art. Of the works themselves, it leaves only fragments behind and communicates itself like a cipher only through the blank spaces from which it has disengaged itself. Touched by death, the hand of the master sets free the masses of material that he used to form its tears and fissures, witnesses to the finite powerlessness of the eye confronted with being are its final work. Having come so far, the essay's last sentence does not surprise us. In the history of art, late works are the catastrophes. Edward Said's unlate style is also a kind of catastrophe. It was never finished by Said, but rather interrupted by his untimely death from leukemia in 2003. 
Michael Wood, who edited the work for its posthumous publication, noted that much cutting and splicing had been required to bring it into being. But among the fragments Wood did not weave into the final work is a tiny note Saeed made in connection with a graduate seminar on last works in late style. He taught only once at Columbia in 1995. It provides the tersest, most penetrating, penetrating epigraph to the work. Conversion of time into space opening up of chronological sequence into landscape, the better to see, experience, grasp, and work with time, refraction. In a late interview, Said once claimed only partly in jest to be the only true follower of Adorno. In Timeliness and Lateness, the first of the constructed chapters of On Late Style, we find Said deep in conversation with Adorno. Their paths cross, which is to say their thinking meets in a moment out of time in which both face the most refractory condition of all. Like Adorno, Said would have been deeply averse to engaging in any redemptive spiritualizing of his personal encounter with mortality. Yet in his radically alienating experience of illness and uncanny proximity to, as Wood writes, the newly unmeasurable future, the unimaginable time beyond time, arose a final opportunity to unsettle his thinking about lateness. I have, Said wrote about the trajectory of his life's work in timeliness and lateness. I have for years been studying this self-making process through three great problematics, three great human episodes common to all cultures and traditions. While his work, Beginnings, Intention and Method, published 30 years before this one, is a book about origins, how things begin in the most elementary sense with birth, the first great problematic, and the continuity that occurs after birth, the dialectic of incarnation, the second great problematic, on late work concerns the last great problematic, the last or late period of life, the decay of the body, the onset of ill health or other factors that even in a younger person bring on the possibility of an untimely end. The kind of lateness that draws Saif is different from that found, for instance, in wondrously serene, holy late works like Sophocles' Oedipus at Colonus and Shakespeare's Tempest, works that have reconciled their dispute with nature and time. This form of lateness that affirms some human hope, that hopes, that is, that in the end, out of aging and suffering, transcendent work can come, alluring as it is, is set aside. Instead, Said turns toward Adorno, now more than ever the companion beside him, before and after him, and into an antinomian vision of lateness, late work thought, in which irresolution and fragmentariness are constitutive, neither ornamental nor symbolic of something else. Among Said's descriptions of late work, he returns most often to notions of anachronism and anomaly. Lateness, he concludes, is a kind of self-imposed exile from what is generally acceptable, coming after it and surviving beyond it. Late style forsakes the fullness of identity unfolded across time, for identity accosted and shattered by the temporality of the outside, that condition of openness without intimacy, without protection or retention. From his reading of and with Adorno, Said seeks out other artists or thinkers inhabiting the condition of lateness across many different time periods and regions. His canon includes Thomas Mann, Richard Strauss, Jean Genet, Giuseppe Tomasi de Lampedusa, Cavafy, Euripides, Benjamin Britten, Gerard Manley Hopkins, Marcel Proust, and Mozart. Rather than follow him further in these byways, however, I will turn here to one not noted by him, but of the company he summons, Dickinson, a writer whose untimeliness, the first and last source of her hiddenness, we are only beginning to approach. Interlude one. And so in the late hour here, we step into the region of Dickinson's most untimely work, the fragmentary writings of the 1870s and 1880s. Like the limit texts of other writers, Kafka's conversation slips, Pascal's pensée, Wittgenstein's remarks on color, 
Dickinson's fragmentary verses belong more to the space of creation than communication. Here, late style cannot be separated from the most unclear part of any hermeneutic labor, the labor of thinking. It is a style, a thought in extremis. It affronts us by its strangeness. In these works, Dickinson has entered the sphere in which the artist lives only for her own consummation. She makes no attempt to ingratiate herself with her readers or the culture industry they inhabit, or to reduce the distance between them and the work's untimely and exilic message. It may have been the extreme vulnerability of these writings, almost certainly partly lost and partly preserved by fate, that led me long ago to assemble some of them in radical scatters, and others more recently in the gorgeous nothings. Yet the fragments never coalesced into a unified collection. And indeed, I do not believe that there will come a time when any editor will bring about their harmonious synthesis. For if on occasion, one or two or even several act as strange attractors, drawing near to one another, forming a small constellation, so at other times each appears as a separate antinomic text, far away from the others, unassimilated and unassimilatable to a totalizing figure. Adorno is whispering in my ear. The power of subjectivity in the late works of art is the irascible gesture with which it takes leave of the works themselves. It breaks their bonds, not in order to express itself, but in order expressionless to cast off the appearance of art. Of the works themselves, it leaves only fragments behind. To the constellation of conditions Adorno and Said associate with late work, so full of its own unworking, difficulty, parataxis, sejura, fragmentation, shinen, the flicker, Dickinson's late lyric throws add another, embrace of the wager, willingness to give up the work to chance for dissemination in futures neither she nor anyone else could foresee. In the many iconic photographs of the scene of Dickinson's writings, we see her 18 by 18 inch cherry desk supporting a single fascicle bathed in sunlight from the west facing windows. The pristine surface of the desk suggests a quiet order. But in the latest hours of Dickinson's life, there may have been another desk a crude writing board, 16 by 19 inches of uncertain provenance, painted on one side, curved to fit over the knees. The board seems designed for a practice of writing in the moment. Splashed in places with white paint, it may have offered an intermittently bright surface for writing in bed during illness or only in the dark of night. Under the painted surface, traces of lost texts may still be recovered. At once tabula rasa and mystic writing pad, the crude lap desk is also movable, part of the drift of the infinite. Around it, I see the room filling with papers. There are stacks of them on the table, on the floor, on the bed. She moves them. The wind moves them. Time moves them. My imagination moves them until there is a whirling and whirring of marks in the air. I see her desk and I do not see it. The lap desk embodies the greater mystery of writing's reportlessness, a condition Dickinson associated with both lateness and joy. In the close readings of just a few fragments drawn from the late archive that follow, the contingent disjunctive and essentially untimely nature of the fragments and their relationship to one another is registered in readings that are themselves often contingent, disjunctive, errant. Concerned with language and risk, faith and doubt, these few fragments serve as my point of departure for a reading as yet only imagined of the hundreds of surviving fragments in which definitive analysis of the texts is deferred in favor of an opportunity to bear witness to their simultaneous falling together and apart. Part two, wandering down the latitudes. What a hazard. In her late writings, Dickinson almost never speaks of language unaccompanied by alarm. What a hazard a letter is. When I think of the hearts it has cleft or healed, 
I almost winced to lift my hand to so much as a superscription. But then we always accept ourselves scuttled and or sunk. This fragment, A809, found among Dickinson's papers after her death, has filiations to two other documents, both letters written in 1885. In one, sent to an unidentified recipient, the lines are slightly altered. What a hazard an accent is. When I think of the hearts it is scuttled or sunk, I almost fear to lift my hand to so much as a punctuation. In the other, sent to her mentor, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, the lines conclude a letter seeking information about her friend, Helen Hunt Jackson, reported on the point of death by the Springfield Republican. Dear friend, I was unspeakably shocked to see in the morning paper. She wrote me in spring that she could not walk, but not that she would die. I was sure you would know. Please say it is not so. What a hazard a letter is. When I think of the hearts it is scuttled and sunk, I almost fear to lift my hand to so much as a superscription, trusting that all is peace in your loved abode with alarm, your scholar. In the 19th century, advances in the harnessing of electricity made communication swift as lightning, subtle as ether. Yet the letter, even before mechanical or electronic means allowed it to mimic the angels, has always arrived suddenly. How it seeks us out, how it aims at us, writes Hélène Sissou. And more often than joy, it is some death it brings us. The letter halts our breath. A superscription may be an address or direction from a letter written on the outside of an envelope. Yet the superscription of an address does not guarantee that a letter will reach its destination. The addressee may have moved or exchanged worlds. I almost fear to lift my hand. Six days after the news report, Helen Hunt Jackson was dead. Before or was it after? No, I think it was certainly before. Dickinson wrote the fair copy letter postmarked August 6th, 1885 to Dickinson. She wrote the unaddressed, undated fragment A809. Undated, dateless, for the fragment does not belong to a relative time before, after, but only to the hour or instant of its inscription, quick a pencil. As if bodily gesture were continuous with spiritual attitude, the handwriting of A809 is unusually distorted. Large, recklessly formed letters suggest that Dickinson was writing under duress or in darkness. In the second line, the word hazard stretches across the manuscript. What a hazard a letter is. In the late writings, it is language, the word itself, that is hazarded. Rather than pursue the genetic relations between the fragment and the letters in which it appears as a trace, I want to follow Dickinson to the place where all such relations break off, to the fragment, to language on its edge. Like the late Holderlin of whom Zimmer reported, he writes as soon as he has something to write, whether on a piece of paper or a scrap of wood. In the 1880s, Dickinson seems to have written immediately and whatever and on whatever was near to hand. A809 is inscribed vertically on the torn away flap of a book's dust jacket. Here, language appears not along the horizontal plane of communication between human beings, but as the vertical join to the divine. The double play of Dickinson's variants, superscription, salutation, signifies the fragment's links to the mystical. Here, the line of vision slants upward to the right, as in an enunciation. What a hazard a letter is. When A809 appears in the letter to Higginson, it reappears as a citation. A human hand writes it, quotes it in a human context. But the hand that scribbles the text in the dark is transfixed only by words that wake her and that come from something outside her. The blur of the fragment, its illegibility, is the blur of a hand writing a voice it is hearing. What a hazard a letter is. But this is not the end of the message. Right beside the peril of language is the joy of language. I almost went to lift my hand to so much as a superscription, Dickinson says. I almost fear, I hardly dare, she repeats. And then the hand rises and she writes. 
In the very moment when the heart is cleft or healed, in a single pencil stroke, she accepts the, lang the wager language is. A single, one thrill can end the life or open it forever. The alarm that attends language is also arousal. The joy bursts out. Like Pascal's famous wager, Dickinson's fragment A809 describes an ontological situation in which there are in fact no options. Though language is a hazard, the most dangerous of goods by Holderlin's claim, it is finally the only connection we have to each other and to that which is beyond us. We must take our chances. We must hazard language. As in the Pascalian wager, moreover, in Dickinson's, it is the inward spaces of the heart, cleft, scuttled, sunk, healed, that is the site of risk. Found among her papers after her death, the fragment is evidence she knew she could not embrace the hazard language is and remain accepted from it. In the end, Dickinson would wager everything, the literally thousands of manuscripts scattered in her room, the thousands more scattered beyond it, upon hazard. A superscription is a heading or a signature. What a hazard a letter is, written in pencil on a crumpled and torn scrap of paper, paradoxically serves as the only possible superscription to Dickinson's undated, unaddressed, and untitled oeuvre. We do not hear it coming. Among Dickinson's fragments of verse from the 1870s and 1880s are several that allude to the end of the world. A few, like the following fragment, look back on the end from such a great distance that the ended world looks infinitesimal, just as the tiny scrap of page paper on which Dickinson scribbled the lines, Pompeii, all its occupations crystallized, everybody gone away. More often, however, Dickinson writes of the end of the world in the present absolute. The consciousness of subsiding power is too startling to be admitted by men, but best comprehended by the meadow over which the flood has quivered, rumbled, when the waters return to their kindred and the tillage acre is left alone. Not knowing when the dawn will come, I open every door, or has it feathers like a bird, or billows like a shore. In these late barely lyrical writings, the acceleration of all the trends pointing the, to the destruction of existing conditions ends in solitude and stillness. In the washed over landscape of these texts, there are no longer any spatial or temporal reference points to orient us. It is not day or night or summer or fall or winter or spring. It is not anywhere or nowhere. It is only now. A present so dilated that it reminds us, is this possible, of the conditions of eternity. Not surprisingly, these fragments alluding to the end of the world are not addressed to a person in particular and may not be to any person at all. They have no interlocutor. They take the grammatical form of hieratic statements. What speaks in them seems more like language speaking than the nearer sound of a human voice. At the end of the world, we ask, what happened? And the question brings us face to face with the paradox. It is only possible to ask what happened because the end of the world is never the end. In the following fragment, now called A879, a call for vision is answered by the end of the world that is both recollected and still awaited at the text's close. We must travel abreast with nature if we want to know her. But where shall be obtained the horse? A something overtakes the mind. We do not hear it coming. As in the fragments cited here, all points of orientation, all traces of the local have been swept from the scene. From this landscape, the eye too has departed, replaced by a more anonymous witness, the we who is almost already no one. In the opening line of the fragment, Dickinson seeks the medium that will carry us through nature at nature's own speed. The prerequisite for knowledge, the revelation of nature is velocity. Yet just as the search is to begin, even before it can begin, the we of the fragment is overtaken by a something that comes from the outside and that outpaces both language and nature. 
While the literal ear never hears the sound of approach, the speculative ear has the feeling of opening in the uncanny quiet of a world light years from this one, and nature is a stranger yet. What happened when the world ended? In the wake of the world where there is such tranquility, another more disquieting doubt steals forth. Did it happen? Did anything happen? The exceptional beauty of the fragment may be inseparable from its radical hesitation in the face of this question. What comes and overtakes? Come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Come and see, come and see, come and see, come and see. To overtake means to cross a space, to come upon something unexpectedly, suddenly, violently. The concordances to Dickinson's poems and letters that catalog her uses of the word overtakes along with its many cognates, overwhelmed, overturned, overpowered, overmastered, overflowed, suggested in the 1880s, the experience of being overtaken is most often associated with the experience of engulfment by the tide sometimes but rarely by grace. Yet the something that comes and overtakes is never specifically identified in A879. It is the expectation of a name that is still missing, a pronoun that stands in for an absent noun. The fragment that neither names the something that comes nor offers a narrative of this coming reveals instead the structure of this event. The opening phrase, we must travel abreast with nature if we want to know her but where shall be obtained the horse? Is at once and jammed with and estranged from the closing phrase, a something overtakes the mind. We do not hear it coming. By a dash that initiates the breaking action of Sejura, what Holderlin called the anti-rhythmic suspension of temporal progression and creates the breach through which the unnamed something enters. The abrupt enjambment of the fragile units coupled with the action of the sejura brings about a negative movement whereby the witness who seeks the divine horse on which to ride alongside nature is suddenly carried to another world. While the opening cadence of the fragment is composed in the conditional mood, the closing cadence is cast in the present tense. The witness who seeks is overtaken in the course of the search. Here, the abolition of time, the empty transport figured by the dash, is alternately experienced as the loss of language and engulfing parousia. What comes? Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Come and see, come and see, come and see. At the end of Dickinson's work, in a fragment on the end of the world, we come to an austere definition of poetry. A879, so far misclassified by Dickinson's editors as a prose aphorism, is in fact verse contracted to its most essential elements, sejura and enjambment. The strangeness audible in A879, however, is the effect not only of its austerity, but of its alliance with the outside and the yet to come. The something that comes and overtakes the mind also overtakes the measure of poetry itself. The tension between the semantic and metrical limits that initially structures the fragments at last gives way to an exact concordance of sense and sound. The final line of the fragment, we do not hear it coming, breaks off, opposed not with another line, but with the air of the future itself. A879 is a verse with neither more nor less, but an impossible measure. The it of we do not hear it coming is also a sound we have never heard before, enjambment degree zero. Something overtakes the mind. The impossible measure audible in poetry's enjambment with the future is also audible in the event of reading. Around the same time Dickinson inscribed the text on A879, it is not known whether before or after, she jotted down the following lines on a jagged piece of wrapping paper. Did you ever read one of her poems backward because the plunge from the front overturned you? I sometimes, often, many times have. A something overtakes the mind. The precise nature of the relationship between these two fragments, A879 and A851, is not known. Dickinson may have composed one as a variant of the other, or they may have arisen independently and only encountered and recognized each other in the collision of their final lines. 
The relation between them, however, is rhythmically emphasized before this moment. The turn, the sejura that structures A879 is repeated in A851, where the advent of the something that overtakes the mind breaks the fragment in two. To offset the dangers of reading, the headlong plunge into readings of this, Dickinson employs the tactics, the measures of more prudent readers. Like the proofreader verifying their copy or the prosodist scanning lines to locate missing feet, she tries reading from end to beginning. Perhaps it is this strategy that allows her in this fragment to momentarily recover the use of personal pronouns. The I initially addresses a you as if they were such a thing as a community of readers, as if right reading might still be a shared experience. Come and see, come and see. Yet even as the I addresses the you intimately, confidingly, they are about to be overtaken and parted from each other, from themselves. The mystical relationship with the book, writes Roger Chartier, can be understood as a trajectory in which several moments of reading succeed one another. The installation of an alterity that provides a basis for the subjective quest, the unfolding of a sense of joy, and at the end of the process, cessation of reading, abandonment of the book, absolute detachment. The reader who spends all her attention on the meter and measure of the poem is suddenly overtaken by the measurelessness of reading itself. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. The reader who has given herself over to the poem suddenly has no place of her own but joy, no time of her own but the aporia of reading. As in A879, the arrival of the something that overtakes the mind shifts the fragment from the past to the present, yet the enjambment of A879 and A851 complicates the temporality of both texts. Has the horse arrived before the poem is read from back to front? Has the plunge overtaken and overturned the speaker only after the eye has gone missing at the end of the world? In the evacuated landscape, words stand alone and magnified. The author of the poems to which the I refers is not named. Like the it that comes and overtakes the mind, she is the expectation of a name that is always missing, a pronoun that stands in for an absent noun. Only reading backwards, proofreading will reveal a proper name. The reading that overtakes the mind by contrast frees the poem from its author and its interpreter from all intention and allows if for the first time it to be what it is. What happened? Where are we? The experience of reading Dickinson describes in 851, disorientation, worldlessness, is also the experience of Dickinson's own readers more than a century after her death. A something overtakes the mind. We do not hear it coming. Final interlude, hush, hush. Today we read Late Dickinson in a latening world. What coordinates name this place of awakened ellipsis and pulsating stillness? This place where the very word fossil scape signals a change in scale, a rescaling of the human against the elemental. Here poems and fragments exist as part of the flickering, shimmering field of forces without independent existence and in constant flux. And Dickinson's lyric oeuvre is an entropic place in which the constant surging of time presages its eventual dissolution and passing away. But here in the end times, Dickinson dreamed long before we woke into them, something is starting up again. Is it the voice of floods? There is a rustling, a murmur, crescendi and diminendi. It is only so many small birds singing. They gather and disperse, gather and disperse in the trembling between night and day, a day that still abducts us with its beauty, an ordinary blue night falling on the edge of the Anthropocene. Inaccessibility of origin, no message to decode, only the drift of time and weather. Goodbye dialectic, goodbye. The late work, the late world is a catastrophe. The lyric is a strange stranger singing in its exile to no one 
for everyone. It is very still in the world now, thronged only with music, like the decks of birds, and the seasons take their hushed places like figures in a dream. Thank you.